hit the, there we go. In five, four, three, two, one. Our team included Esteban Duplantier, chief diver. Our senior statesman, my closest colleague for 27 years. Klaus Daimler, 40, engineer, calm, collected, German. Vikram Ray, 28, cameraman, born on the Ganges. Bobby Ogata, 22, frogman. Renzo Pietro, 45, editor, soundman. Vladimir Wolodarsky, 33, physicist, original score composer. Anne-Marie Sackowitz, 25, script girl. Pele Dos Santos, 30, safety expert. Eleanor Zisu, my wife, vice president of the Zisu Society. We had also invited seven marine science students from the University of North Alaska to accompany us as unpaid interns in exchange for school credit. Okay, we're going to Hello and welcome. Welcome and hello. This is Wait, You Haven't Seen? And it's a show where we talk about movies, and specifically, we talk about a movie at least one of us has never seen before. I'm your host, Travis, a.k.a. TV's Travis. This is episode number 225. And the movie we're talking about this week is The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Joining me, because both of them had seen it and been badgering me to watch it. First, my co-host on Those Were the Days and the voice of Aquilo, it's Amy Frost. I was appalled that you had not seen this movie. <laughs> well, we, we fixed that. And also here, because he too could not believe I hadn't seen it, from the Botched Podcast, it's Phil Keating. Phil, how you doing? Uh, I'm all right. I've been badgering you about this for almost two years uh, to get this under your belt. I'm glad that nobody came in to like swoop this under me. Uh, so I'm just glad <clears throat> you gave me an excuse to watch my favorite movie uh, three times in a row this week. <laughs> so I, I always like to start things off and I will start with the two of you since you have a history with this movie Phil you said this is your favorite movie when did you first see this was it in theaters kind of give me some background on it uh 2004 December 25th I saw this opening day on Christmas um <clears throat> you know I was a, a wee 17 year old lad who was too cool cool to go to Jersey with his parents on Christmas. Uh, Catholics <laughs> love that when you decide you want to do something other than go see the family on Christmas. So my best friend and his father called me up and we're like, hey, we're going to go see this new Bill Murray movie. Uh, why don't you come with us? I think it'll be a fun time. And so we got to see this opening night. And as soon as like the movie started, I was just, I was in. And I remember that when the DVD came out, I was in art school in college and like I had a tower records right across from my apartment. And so like, I knew exactly midnight, this movie's coming out. Uh, I'm going to go down there. I had a very difficult decision because make believe by Weezer and the life aquatic both came out on the same night, but I didn't have enough money to get both. So I took <laughs> life aquatic and uh, I still have that standard definition DVD upstairs. Nice. Amy, how about you? What's your what's your history with this movie? Honestly, I don't I don't remember exactly when the first time I saw it was, but this was the I think this might have been my first Wes Anderson movie in which I discovered that Wes Anderson makes films pretty much exclusively for me. And um yeah, I quote this movie constantly i do have i could not find my red hat i also have a team zisu shirt um i troll every now and then because those those uh team zisu adidas are real yeah um oh. they exist they can be found so i do every now and then go check mm. so <laughs> Um, in a uh, overnight drunk this week, I made the rightful decision to finally pull the trigger on the only cosplay that I will be doing at DragonCon this year, uh, which will be uh, Steve. I, I will be part of Team Zizu. I'm not going to yeah. grow my beard out again. Um, <laughs> I looked into the, the Adidas. Uh, they are 450 bucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. said, uh, no, I have... <laughs> bill i have i adult and have bills so yeah. i found a very close uh in comparison and some paint 
so mm-hmm. that I can get the color scheme correct. So, nice. uh, and they just got delivered today. They're sitting downstairs on the table. Oh, awesome! Yeah, because I tell you, when that came up in the movie, I immediately had another window open. I'm like, okay, I, I'm, <laughs> this, I'm positive. Thing? You don't you don't put an Adidas shoe in your movie and not have it be available at some point. Dude, I'm like, all right, and- where, uh, how hard are these to come by, and how much are they? And I saw like. Four fifty five hundred dollars, and I was like, "Well, I will never own a pair of those, but I want some." And it's it sucks because I'm such a sneakerhead, and like, <laughs> like I have a box of Bowie Vans. Uh, they Vans put out a, a set of like different Bowies uh, throughout his generations, and uh, a friend of mine for my birthday surprised me with one of these. I've got the Star Wars. Uh, Con- I'm sorry, I think they were Converse or Vans, one of the two. Mm-hmm. I've got Star Wars Vans up there. I've got Nintendo Vans, you know, in the other closet. And it was just like, oh my god, if I didn't have a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then also, like, I do have a child, so like, when he needs to finally repay his student loans, and when he hits his seventies, he could finally sell these shoes <laughs> and pay back about ten percent of what his loan still is at. So yeah, you that's know, true. it's really an investment. You guys just talked me into it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am the odd one out. I had not seen this movie before. In fact, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Uh, this is only the second Wes Anderson film I've ever seen. Um, and well, here's the emergency weird... episodes that I do have now just become way easier. We're, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to talk offline and divvy these up. Um, <laughs> can I Wait, guess? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I want to. If you had to guess which Wes Anderson film I had seen prior to Life Aquatic, what would you think it is, Phil? I'm curious. Bottle Rocket. Okay, Amy. How about say you? Rushmore. Okay. Uh, well, one of you is correct. Uh, and that is Amy. I had seen Rushmore. Um, I remember it seeing like that. A... Uh, it was. So after... you watched so much obscure things that I figured I it would have been, you know, the first movie. Well, and the funny thing about it is, like, I remember renting Rushmore and watching it and loving it. I had a great time with it, and it was. I was like, this is cool. I like this Wes Anderson guy. And somehow or another, I missed this. And not long after that, because. The movie itself was kind of a box office bomb. Um, and looking into it, it made $37.8 million at the box office worldwide. And it was a $50 million movie, which was about the inverse of what um, Rushmore had been. Rushmore was made for like 20 something million and made 70. So, you know, Wes Anderson wasn't like a huge box office draw, but you would think he would do a little bit better than that. So I missed it there. And then a couple of years later, there was a group of people I knew that did the, the, group costume for Halloween of uh, Team Zisu. And I've known of it, and I know all his other things, and I see, you know, he Wes Anderson has such a distinct style, and it's kind of one of those, Here's... it was it was sort of, for me, Wes Anderson films were like David Lynch films or some other, well, some others of those directors who are very distinct in their style, and I just missed it, and I'm, I'm like trying to play catch up now, and I'm finding out that what the hell was wrong with me? Why was I not watching these for the last twenty years? Because good God, that like I had so much fun. You're the with this one. Movie. You're the odd man out that didn't go to art school. Yeah, that's also true. There's your, there's your thing. <laughs> these are these are like I mean that's how I found Amelie was because it was mm. it it was put up as a as a you see red and green this is how you do it and so it's the kind of the same thing you didn't. You weren't required. <laughs> this is true, <laughs> but point. I was I was around a lot of film school students and yeah. trying to get into film school. So you still would think I, I would have even just accidentally watched something of his. Yeah, but you weren't like on substances in a basement in art school, Again, which is, is where point. this stuff happens. It's not too late. Yeah, like, yeah. we yeah, can still. Just I mean, it my happen. art school is no longer around. Uh, the Art Institute of Philadelphia. Uh, it turns out they were a bunch of criminals and stole a bunch of money from people <laughs> and got sued into oblivion. But yeah. um, I mean, I learned enough there. You could just pay me and I can definitely, <laughs> I have a basement, I've got drugs and I've got a, v- a tube television. What more do we need? <laughs> Perfect. There you go. There you go. I got, I have no arguments the for experience. that. The experience. Yep. <laughs> but I was, so I had an idea going into this that I was probably going to enjoy it because I, you know, it's quir- I knew it was quirky. I knew Wes Anderson had kind of a style. And my memories of Rushmore, and then it started, and holy crap! It just you was, it was, me. it was better than I thought it was going to be from the get go. Like Phil, you said when you saw it in the theater, it had you from the jump, and I was mm-hmm. the same way. Like 
they started it off and you got the guy like from the moment the janitor comes out in his overalls and grabs the microphone off the stage i was like i, I already love this and my notes i didn't have a ton of notes on it but some of them were like i mean here's some of the notes i wrote down god damn i love michael gambon he's just uh-huh. brilliant in this um pele might be my favorite although klaus is also amazing followed a few lines later by damn it klaus quit being so great <laughs> Willem, Willem Dafoe's Klaus. I loved. I mean, I love Willem Dafoe. I anyway, like. But I like good Will. Like this is a rare good guy Willem Dafoe. Like a rare, not too scary. I mean, he's got he's got some moments, but he's like not too scary Willem Dafoe. My favorite thing about Klaus is that even in his wetsuit, they're still shorts. Yes. Uh-huh. Like. It's just, no matter what. I'm not wearing pants. Uh, even if we got to go swimming in cold water, nope. I'm gonna get a, a, sw- a, sp- a swim suit with a with just cutoffs on it. I love it. <laughs> and also, real quick, since we're talking about Klaus, um, they're when they were leaving the hotel at the end. Yeah. Um, and they're all running from the explosion. They took a take where Willem Dafoe was on fire, <laughs> and it was just. T- it it's so good and um the deleted scene is out there somewhere but like the angle just didn't work or mm. there was too much smoke or something because you know steady shot and then willem dafoe runs through the scene completely on fire on his back <laughs> and just you know it doesn't pan it just sits there and it was just like holy shit that was such a good take i wish they would have kept it oh <laughs> that, that's amazing i mean klaus for me klaus was so much fun because a willem dafoe you can tell is having a blast and he has that moment where he gets right up in uh, in Ned's face and slaps him, and then that that scene is it. But when they when they make the callback to that scene a little while later, it's so well done because Ned just walks up to him and slaps him. He's like, "Why why would you do that?" <laughs> well, I owed you one, but no, and like it's just the look on his face <laughs> is so perfect. Warnings. He's like, "You you stood up for yourself. We we were even." It was ah, oh, I loved that so much. Like well, that oh, moment. you no, now we're even. <laughs> and he's all upset because they're even. They're like storms off. Um, no, like the cast is just. I mean, it was another. You know, again, I knew Bill Murray was in it. I knew, um, but and I know that a lot of these actors, like Wes Anderson, works with uh-huh. a lot of the same actors over and over. Um, yeah. Also, I misquoted. I said that uh, Rushmore was made for twenty-one million or so and made like seventy. That was Royal Tenenbaums, which I also have not mm. seen. Um, mm. Jesus but... Christ, <laughs> Travis. Travis. Look, I know. I, oh, I know. Look, that's part of why this show exists, right? To fix these things. So, <sighs> well, you, the two of you, can divvy up the Wes Anderson uh, catalog, oh, and we will, God. we will fix this. Um. But like I knew, you know, Bill Murray. I've seen Bill Murray in uh, in Rushmore, and I knew he worked with him. Uh, and Owen Wilson, who uh, I did enjoy in this quite a bit. Ned was a, f- a very fun character. Um, I don't always love Owen Wilson, but same. I do. I do in this one. Like, yeah, it's it's literally this movie and you, me, and Dupree are those those are the top two movies. Oh, um, I I really like I was... him in the Darjeeling Limited. Okay, I love so... that movie more than like a lot of. A lot we're gonna have to fight because i also agree no you mean <laughs> Dupree, i got stuck on an auto train from uh florida to dc and they only had one movie in the dvd player and it was you me and dupree and i had to sit there for 12 12 hours to the point where it was like literally clockwork orange where it's just like <laughs> I'm losing my mind, but I'm still mouthing all of the words to this movie that I absolutely hate. Um, but I mean, I guess it could have been worse. It could have just... been Marley and me. Oh, I've seen that too. Um, <laughs> but... I would have jumped off the train at that point. The, the good thing about, well, so it was in the smoking train. Like the, they still had smoking cars when I was on this train. Oh, okay. So yeah. I, I was there on my own volition getting tor- waterboarded by Julie and Dupree. Waterboarded um, by addiction. Excellent. A plus. <laughs> my autobiography. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I like Ned in this movie because they reference 11 and a half and that's kind of his, his whole innocent vibe is that childhood, yeah. you know, southern 
just gentleness that he has through this movie. And he, you're right. He never plays roles like this. So it was really refreshing to see him, you know, not be the, the James Dean S kind of weird looking broken nose guy, but just like this fawn who is entering mm -hmm. a new woods that he's not familiar with. Yeah, and I, I also liked the reveal at one point of that Zisu shoots blanks, but nobody except uh, Eleanor knows it. Um, by the way, Angelica Houston, love her. I love her so, so much. I've always much. loved her. I love her in everything. And like I, I love her in Wes Anderson movies because he just lets her just be, and it's real good. Like, the, I... So I feel like some people just still want her to be Morticia. Right. And, um, and, I, obviously, and he just lets her be like an adult woman. And because <laughs> the first thing when I hear her name, the first thing that pops into my head is of Morticia course. because that movie came out at the perfect time for me, Adam's family. Uh -huh. And it, it you know made an impression. But to see her in you know roles like this is so much fun because it's so different. I did just recently a couple months ago. She was in um, John Wick Chapter three. And I liked her in that just because it was, again, just a different role. She's playing like a, um, I mean, it's John Wick. So she's like a way over the top kind of character. But this was great because she's just so deadpan and so funny. Like when they get to the island and she just walks up, your cat's dead. Your cat's I'm sorry. dead. <laughs> <laughs> a rattlesnake bit, bit, it, bit in it in the, the neck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Why did like, I say it like that? I just, this is oh. my research assistant. <laughs> what? Javier, my research assistant. And it's it's like every character reveal is just better and better. You know, Kate Blanchett shows up on the beach and it's like, Where where'd you come from? You look pregnant. I am pregnant. How did you get here? <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's the beach in the middle of the night. And oh, I love that. And again, she like Kate Blanchett's someone that I see in a movie so and good. it's immediately better because she's in it. And she was really pregnant during this movie. Yeah, um, uh, I did read they that. Were, they were fitting her for um, her her prosthetic belly, and she fainted. And they took her to get checked out, and she was actually pregnant. So um, <laughs> she was talking about it on the behind the scenes that I watched, and she's like, "Yeah, like I was freshly pregnant and hormonal, hormonal, <laughs> and it like really fold, you know, molded this character." into something very special because it's a real emotion that you're getting out of me because uh parasite in tummy <laughs> <laughs> and i yep. did like the the line in one of the trivia bits that wes anderson uh, accused her of overly method acting <laughs> which <laughs> is pretty pretty amazing um but yeah like she's great and then of course jeff goldblum i mean jeff goldblum can be in a movie for 30 seconds and like, he the first thing he says, it's like, how's things going with your little leopard fish? And I'd lo I was done. I'm like, all right. I now just like, I love, I love that introduction because it's the way, because they're like, oh, can we get a picture of you with Captain Hennessy? And he's yeah. like, where? And then the crowd like parts. <laughs> yep. and he's like majestically standing there because he's so tall and yep. gangly. Now, I'd I will say statue make it just... quick. I will say <laughs> that uh, while Jeff Goldblum is great in 99% of the movie that he's in, he does have my least favorite moment in the entirety of the film, and that's where he rolls up the newspaper and Hits whacks the, the dog. dog with it. Because yeah. don't, don't whack Cody. Don't hit Cody. Cody's... But when he's wearing the I'm a Pepper shirt. <laughs> no. I fold. <laughs> <laughs> Are you here to rescue me? And then just turns back to like, fold. <laughs> so Dude, I know, I, I know that we're bouncing around really oh, all over the place, but like, that's one of my favorite lines is like they're leaving the rescue and and, and Steve's like, oh no, we left Cody. We got to go back for Cody. <laughs> and and no, everyone's just like. <laughs> and no one puts any effort and he's like, bye Cody. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell, Cody. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, and Cody was, Cody was great for his uh, little bit of screen time. I love, I mean, anytime, mm -hmm. three-legged dog is always Always good. Yeah. I was half expecting him to, him to say lucky. Like, I really was. Yeah. And there was a long enough pause that I'm like, I'm waiting for it, waiting for it. And then he says Cody. And I was like, that's better, honestly. That's a, that's a funny name. It's a good name. Um, I love, okay, some of the smaller roles uh, were great. Bud Court 
is the the uh, Bond Company Stooge. Bond Stooge. Which oh. is a so great he's got, character, anyway. He's got my favorite line in... Well, second... Oh gosh. You know what? He's got <laughs> one of my favorite lines in this entire movie, uh, which, Travis, I know uh, this is sometimes a PG-13 show, so I'm going to use our one only. Uh, okay. When they have Hennessy, you know, back yeah. in the Belafonte, <laughs> and he sees the cappuccino machine, just, how did... And then the Bond suit just says... We fucking stole it, man. <laughs> Which I use he's, constantly. He's got his and it, glass of wine. Like, <laughs> okay. We've both it. been through hell. I'm done. Like, I have lived all the experiences. <laughs> I'm no longer, you know, caring about the situation. And I try to use that constantly. Like, oh, where's my, where's my twenty sided? I effing stole it, man. And it just goes over everyone's head constantly. I had to stop the movie at that point. And give myself a couple minutes because I oh, so lost it. I was laughing so hard. I, I, it happened. I was laughing. I backed it up. I listened to it a second time. I can. I, I laughed harder. Then I recorded it, <laughs> and then I had to stop and give myself a minute to calm down so that I could continue on with the movie because it was so perfect. It was so perfectly delivered. And you're right. It's Look. that that character of Bill had been through so much at that point. He's just like. <laughs> They just and and he, you can tell he starts the line off like he's gonna give him some sort of explanation, some some kind of roundabout, and then he just gives up halfway through. It's like they just effing stole it, man. <laughs> Even when he's introduced in the elevator, like yeah. he delivers that <laughs> that line as well. Don't put us through the the ringer, man. You're a company bond stooge. Well, I'm also a human. <laughs> You're right. That was mean of me. <laughs> Team on three. <laughs> and when they're when they're on the boat getting the pirates are there and he's talking to the pirates and they're like he's like obviously they're taking Ned and then and you can tell he's like wait what hold on a second uh, apparently now it might be me because they found they they realize that I can speak Filipino like <laughs> he gets oh. gut punched yeah. we'll get the you back call. Billy the phone call yeah. and they get the <laughs> message oh, thanks for checking in bill which i love the way that bill murray delivers that line because i feel like there's something special when actors talk to another character that have their real name right mm -hmm. like i feel like i feel like the well thanks for checking in bill was like deep personal bill murray feelings and and Bill Murray is so good in this. I mean, I know that he can sometimes be difficult to work with, and there's been stories that have come out about him in the past, whether it's just kind of strange stuff on set or just in general difficult. Not quite to Chevy Chase levels. Like, he's not at the point where people don't want to work with him at all, but, yeah. you know, he's he, he's cantankerous at times, but he's so good when he's on. And yeah. he well, is just on in this movie, and he's, he's great so fun to watch. He, he held everything together apparently on set because like he he knows that these wes anderson movies take a while to shoot mm -hmm. because it takes a while to set up the shot and then get a lot of shots in in the right perfect way in wes's weird texas brain but like apparently <laughs> when things did start getting contentious on set bill kind of like calmed everybody down because he understood with this being the third wes anderson movie like hey look we got something special everybody just take as much time as you need um which i can't even imagine having to do all these underwater shots and like not lose your cool constantly yeah mm -hmm. yeah i can see where where making a wes anderson film as an actor or you know somebody on the set w could be tr tough there's so much yeah. setup and he does a lot of those long takes and a lot of which as a viewer i love i'm a sucker for long takes i'm a sucker I like his style because he's got this weird, quirky style where some directors want like the act of filmmaking to sort of melt into the background and not really be noticed. It's sort of the whole idea of like, don't get caught acting, just act. Don't get caught making a film, just sort of be there and, and, and make the film. But he, his movies, the, the two that I've seen so far anyway, and especially this one, ride that line because he has stuff like the set of the Belafonte sliced in half and the camera moving between all the rooms and the fact that like it feels both like you're uh, watching uh, just a regular kind of Hollywood film and a stage play at the same time. hundred yeah. percent. And I dig that because not enough, like 
it's it's not something you see a lot of, and it could be the type of thing that could put you out of a movie pretty quickly. But he has such a deft hand with it, and he's so good at setting that up and creating that look. And even simple things like when um, when Goldblum's character comes to the ship and they they react to the distress call, and like that moment to me at first felt very much like um, it was like an office style sort of mockumentary uh, where he's, he's talking, he's like, we, we responded to your just Steven, my God, Steven, is that you? And like the camera whipping <laughs> back and forth. And then it cuts to Goldblum sitting there on that couch. And it's like, where did the couch come from? Why do they have that on the deck? You can One almost pretty boys brought it up. Yeah. And you clearly. can almost like feel the studio lights, like just off frame, you know, it, like you know that they're there and they're not trying to hide the fact that they're there kind of thing. And I like that. Yeah. I, it works here so well. Um, so that was a thing that I really, uh, I glommed on to. And I, I have a feeling like uh, I'm going to enjoy much more in some of his other movies. Like I, I feel like that, that, f- that type of thing happens more because the trailer for asteroid city, yeah. for instance, his latest movie feels like that kind of a shot of gold bloom on the couch on the deck of the boat for an entire movie. Yeah. It feels like everything is composed that way. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but no, I I, I loved that kind of stuff. Um, I did not expect any of the action stuff on the boat and then at the hotel either. Like, I don't know what I was expecting exactly. Like, when I started the movie, I didn't anticipate the... I, I don't even think I really knew much story-wise other than, you know, he was a Jacques Cousteau kind of pastiche. But past that, I didn't know what was going to happen. So when they go on a rescue mission uh, at the derelict hotel, uh, the Hotel Citroën, I was like, oh, oh, this is even, this keeps getting better. Like, it just kept layering more and more good stuff on top of it as the movie went on. I, I, I could not get enough of it. Uh, and, and on top of that, the music. The music throughout Hello. the movie. I mean, the reason the reason uh-huh. I had Pele <laughs> might be my Go favorite. On. Pele being might maybe being my favorite character in the movie is after the third time we see him playing the acoustic guitar doing a uh, David Bowie cover, and then um, and I didn't know what language it in was. Portuguese. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know it was Portuguese. Portuguese. And then yeah, I read afterwards Brazilian. that he translated all of the songs to Portuguese and arranged them on the guitar himself to play them for the movie. But uh-huh. in the in the course of watching the movie, I was just like, "This is brilliant." This ju- and and it was the first time I'm like, "Oh, that's that's clever." And the second, but by that third time, I'm like, "This is a brilliant running gag that they continue to do with him." And my favorite one is when the pirates are floating up in the background, in the foggy background, yeah. and he's just playing it completely. <laughs> while he's on watch. Yeah, yeah. While he's on watch. Oh, they're not good. They're bad. <laughs> they're they're very they're very bad at what they do, for sure. Yeah. Well, that, um, I mean, this whole movie is about failure almost. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> but, yeah, when he's on watch and the ladder just clinks up. But also, <laughs> like, this is a known problem. Like, who the shit is King Zizu? Like, they've been <laughs> having watch problems the <laughs> this entire trip yeah. and still can't get it right. But, <laughs> dude, Sue George, man. Like, Sue that dude. Sue George. I have seen him live. <gasps> um. And it happened by mistake. Um, <clears throat> I went to Bonnaroo in 2005 because Radiohead was one of the closing night uh, acts. And so when everybody was loading in on the Thursday morning, uh, they had a couple smaller bands. And so I went down there and Sue George was on stage. And I like, I exploded <laughs> my brain. I was like, how is there only 300 people here right now? Like, yeah. this is incredible. So, like, I got to hear a lot of his Portuguese uh, music, which was just yeah, wonderful. Like, just so uplifting and just, uh, like, literally body moving. And then he would bring in a couple of these Bowie covers as well. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh, And so, be... like, it's funny because, like, if I decided I wanted to sleep instead of, like, putts around the the fairgrounds for a little bit i i would have missed it and it's just one of those happenstances that it was just like no nah, you know what i've been in the car for 14 hours i want to walk around and see what's what amazing that is awesome yeah um and 
I also my my final note was as the credits started rolling, and I was like, of course, Mark Mothersbaugh did the music. Like, why didn't yeah. I figure that out partway through the movie? Because the the Bowie covers were great, <clears throat> but the the rest of the score was so good too. Do, 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 yeah, it's do, do, do. it's that it's so good Casio keyboard I, like demo mm-hmm. music is so I definitely perfect. didn't learn that on my cat keyboard like a couple minutes ago <laughs> before we went live. Um but the, I mean this is the this is Mother Bomb's third movie with with Wes. He did the first the first four of them. And like it's funny because like each one of these movies has a different feel, right? Mm-hmm. Um yeah. The, the Royal Tenenbaums has that regal, posh, uh, very string-heavy original music, and it's you know such a diversion to change to these electronica, almost kind of like broken down Devo songs that really never hit like the B sides. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> he's such a beautiful genius when it comes to music and scoring. And, um, you well, know, the more you dive into Mark Mothersbaum, the more you realize that, like, he's done most of the music through our childhood. Yeah. And, like, all these cartoon mm-hmm. shows uh, is composed by him. And, like, I and, feel like he's one of those people that can see music, right? They they hear it and it, there's – I forget the name of it when, when it – you can physically see oh like like, like uh like synesthesia synesthesia. Yeah, synesthesia synesthesia thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i bet because like and and the thing is a good musical score whether it's an orchestral one or something a little more off the beaten path in terms of movie scores should fit the the movie like john williams when you when you bring him in and he does you know indiana jones like he gets that feeling of adventure and it you listen to the Indiana Jones theme and it just makes you want to get up and like run out and do something uh, crazy like like riding on the back of a truck, you know, by by a bullwhip or something weird like that. Like it's just that kind of music drives you to do that. The the thing <laughs> Throw with... people off Zeppelins. We're just exactly. Things yeah. Now. Just yeah. for whatever. Yeah. But what was so great about this was that that music fit the feeling of this like ragtag group. That... It's the music that their budget their budget the team could do. ZSU yes. budget could afford. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's that. the thing. If like, if you take a close and a real close look at everything inside the Belafonte, we first off we don't know what year it is, but no. nothing's been updated. No. Nope. Like nothing has been updated. I mean, they Steve have real... even Steve even says when like you know this is the kitchen. It's got the most advanced most equipment advanced. on the yeah. ship. <laughs> And if they had money, they wouldn't have to rely on Eleanor's parents to get him out of jail every time. And that whirly bird would have been inspected years ago. True. But like just to see the we, the real to real and Wolodowski having all the different Casio keyboards to work on the scores, man. It's just like there's nothing I love more than like old tech. I mm-hmm. love 70s and 80s tech. I love it. Like if I go antiquing, that's exactly what I'm looking for is these old old tech pieces for me just to take apart and put back together. And so that's why like the inside of the Belafonte, just like every time I watch it, I find something different, which is like, Oh, look at that. I need that. Can I also say, uh, on the Belafonte itself, um, I ca- I, I caught on to the naming, uh, early on. And then, then I read in the trivia, but I remembered that, uh, Cousteau's boat was called the Calypso. So mm-hmm. to have yes. your pastiche of Jacques Cousteau and it's yep. the Belafonte, I was like, oh, that's inspired. Like that I is just, just some like, good writing right there. I like so he named he named the sub Jacqueline after his <laughs> first wife, yeah. and then renamed it Deep Search, which is funny. But the better part is that he has her name tattooed, and he also just crossed that out and wrote Deep Search. But it's the same on the sub as well. <laughs> yes. Oh. And like I thought about it, I'd be like, that would be a really funny tattoo for like three of us. Right? <laughs> and like not even three people that are like prevalent in my life. It would be so, like on random people at Dragon Con would be like, I would do something like this to scratch my shoulder and like somebody <laughs> five hundred yards away would, <laughs> would shout and be like, definitely worth it. Definitely they would just hold it. up their they would just hold up their team Zisu junior member ring. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> 
And you know what? I would write them uh, on my correspondence and have a red tap and a speedo sent their way. So there were so many great, like, I I adore when movies will follow through or call back to their own stuff. Like, I've said this many, many times. Hot Fuzz is one of my favorite movies because as a comedy script, it's brilliant in that every joke they set up in the beginning of the movie is paid off at the end by the end of the movie. Every single one. Yeah. And comedies don't normally aren't able to do that. Not, a lot of times they just don't execute that well. But they set up so many jokes at the beginning and fire them all off. This movie did that too. Like you see the ring early on and it's then it's not mentioned again until they have their little fight on the deck and he sucker punches him and he's like, I think your team Zisu ring caught me in the lip. And like I had uh-huh. forgotten about the ring by that point. And so you're bringing that back and reminding me of it and it made me laugh. Or the, the, the chopper, the, the, whirly, the whirly bird. Like that becoming a thing Chekhov's later on. helicopter. <laughs> yeah. Now, did he? Did he? He gave that Ned's ring to Werner, right? Uh, yeah. Klaus's nephew. I think so. That's mm-hmm. what he gave him, right? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. 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 So it's just like that's one of the last shots of the movie, and it's just like what a beautiful bow uh, to tie this up with. Because one of the first scenes movie, is is Werner giving giving Steve the the rainbow. Uh, crayon. Oh yeah, the crayon, crayon uh, uh, pony fish. C- yeah, pony fish. Yeah. Sea pony, pony, whatever it was. That uh, the stop. Uh, by the way, the stop leopard, motion stuff. Fish? I mean, we the stop Dude, motion. We, we haven't even talked about we haven't the stop talked about it. Oh god. So this is going to be a four-hour podcast. <laughs> I hope so everybody's good. ready. I think. I think my favorite one is the um the mating crabs. Yes. The, the stripy crabs. Good. Yes. Just like that's mating and then <laughs> it just rips, rips an arm off. their arms and walks away. Is that mating? <laughs> and and I knew I knew that Wes Anderson did some stop motion stuff because I know of Fantastic Mr. Fox and Isle of Dogs. Mm. I've seen the trailers for those. I still haven't seen the movies. I'm gonna get there. But we'll, we'll get there. But like I knew that the stop motion was a thing that he did. And I think I remember somebody telling me at some point that there was some stop motion like undersea stuff. And so I thought there was Everything. more. I thought like more All of the that animals. happened or something. But, but uh, to the, what every time they did it, it was so good. Like the, during the opening movie presentation, when they have the what do they call them the the glowing snapper or whatever. The neon. Yeah, and they have that shot of um, they they have the, the shot of Esteban. <laughs> like horribly blue screened, you know, thumbs up with all of them swimming behind him. And I was like, Oh God, that's so good. And it just, again, it just got better from there. Every time, you know, he holds up the bag and you got the little crayon pony fish and that stop motion was great. The shark, the Jaguar shark, when they finally reveal that at the end, uh, Uh my note on that was holy cripes on toast. That's a big shark. It's a big shark. Cause you realize all all those people are in that sub. And that shark, which only sits, it. it only sits six, right? Yeah, and they think, um, but all the stop go and anim- uh, stop animation was just done by Henry Selick, yeah. and so like that him and so his studio sense. took mm-hmm. took all of this on, and just really would send in test puppets, and then Wes would have something to say, and then they have to go back and start back again. But like, it was crazy because for the jaguar shark to have it look since it was such a big puppet to have it look like it was floating and swimming through water they actually inverted it so it was upside down so it would have that weightlessness of of uh, of movement oh, okay. it's just like everything that, that they did my my favorite thing was uh the hennessy turtle the enterprise the That's enterprise yes, did the that enterprise That's what it was. <laughs> yes <laughs> Tennessee's research turtle, I think, was my favorite. As, uh... <laughs> oh, that was so good. That again was like a great gag because the, we, we've mentioned the research turtles a couple of times, and even as they're leaving the island, and Hennessy's like, yeah. "They made soup out of my research turtles," <laughs> and I was so sad about that because no. And then he sees him. And he's like, "It's one of my research turtles," and you can tell how happy he is to see his turtle out there, and like. Ah, I love that. And you're right. That was a great puppet, too. Like, I, sh- oh. I should have known it was Henry Selleck well, that did that, though. I mean, well, I mean, everything he produces is just yeah. like, 
I man, I I had a podcast called Cell by Cell, which was a animation podcast that never got released, and we did uh, an episode on Selleck, and just like it was forty minutes of us just drooling over everything that he did, <laughs> and like yeah, I, it's still in the can somewhere, and it's just like man, I'm gonna have to edit the heck out of that, but I also want that project to hit light a day because. I'm such a big animation fan. Well, <sighs> and, you know, when it comes to stop motion, there are two names that always come to mind for me. Uh, outside of Ray yeah. Harryhausen, that's that's a whole different they thing. Yeah. Like Harryhausen's his own. But the names that always come to mind when I think of stop motion, and I know there are other people doing it, but it's, it's Henry Selleck and Phil Tippett. Those are the two names I think of when I think of stop motion. And when I'm watching this, this is very clearly Henry Selleck style. And I, I, in no way Phil Tippett, uh, which, by the way, have either of you seen or heard of his movie uh, that he just released a couple years ago, Mad God? Tippett's? No. So Tippett, Phil Tippett, real quick aside, because I watched this a couple of weeks ago, or I watched like the last half of it. I missed the first part. Um, they were playing it on the last drive-in with Joe Bob Briggs. And it is a stop motion. It is not an easy watch. It is way out there. Um, it's more of an art experience than a film per se, but it would, it took him 30 years to make this. He started according to Wikipedia. He had a mental breakdown he, yeah. <laughs> during <laughs> it. So the Joe Bob episode, he came out and interviewed for most of the runtime. Like all the interstitials were Joe Bob talking to Phil Tippett about making this movie. And he did one of my favorite things that an artist will do. And, uh, it's, it's something that Lynch does a lot as well. Have mental breakdowns. Well, there's that, but also uh, at one point, Joe Bob asks him, "Like, okay, Phil, just what's what's this movie about?" And Tippett looks at him and he pauses for a second. He goes, "Well, it's about 82 minutes," <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. And he's like, yes. and he, he he refuses to give any better of an answer than that. And it's outstanding. It's weird. It has to do with like uh, a character going into, I think, depths of hell or something. I don't know. It's out there, but the animation is amazing. Phil, if you, if you're a fan of animation, you got to watch Mad God. I'll find um, it, man. If I can survive Gummo, I can survive any movie. <laughs> Boy, if that isn't a true statement. Whew. Um, but yeah, I just like thinking, it, talking about stop motion made me think of that. And it's definitely worth watching. Amy, I don't know, knowing the types of movies you like, I'm not sure if you would like Mad God because there are parts oh. of it that are like weird, grotesque stuff, yeah. but it's also yeah. animated. So like, it's a little different. I don't know, but yeah. it's, uh, it's really, really interesting as, as just huh. kind of a piece of art. But like, those are the two names I think of when I think of stop motion are, are Henry Selleck and Phil Tippett. And that shark did i read right the the shark at the end was eight feet long for a puppet yes as a stop motion puppet like that's not yep that's not jurassic park making an animatronic you know full-size yeah. uh tyrannosaurus rex like that's different this is a stop motion puppet you're making that's eight feet long holy crap <laughs> Which is sometimes the normal size of like a normal actual shark. Yeah. 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 It seems that's <laughs> like if you if you ask me how big a shark is, like yeah, that's a number I would give. Yeah, <laughs> about eight feet. You know, I don't know. And no, uh, they... uh, getting back to the music though, like, dude. So when that Sigur Ross song hits, as they come upon and the the the, the jaguar shark slowly comes into uh -huh. frame and the mm. music is swelling as the the shark is getting closer like i'm already a cigar ross fan but like first off now i can't hear that song without um, <laughs> thinking of this movie but also like oh, dude like i get really emotional about movies and things like if i put crying on my resume because i'm so gosh darn good at it <laughs> and like now just hearing the, uh the song from cigar ross just gives me this emotion of this of the end of life aquatic of this guy you know losing his best friend losing his budget losing a possibly adopted son and like everything just for this moment as everybody reaches in to put a hand on steve it's just like oh 
I can't. Real and good. I also I can't do Ned's funeral with that zombie song playing. Oh, like I... zombies, if you ask me zombies favorite band of mine from the 60s next to the Beatles, right? Mm -hmm. The Zombies Odyssey and Oracle is one of the best records ever made and like I can't hear that zombie song during Ned's funeral that and not just break down, you know. Even like if I'm driving to work and I've got Spotify on and that song comes on, it's just like, ah, <laughs> fine, we're going to sit through this 280, but I'm not going to be happy about it. It's it's one cuz music is such a thing that touches us emotionally anyway. Like, and then, you know, good artists matching music to a scene in a film just amplifies that so much more. And now you've, like you said, you can't hear those songs without connecting them to this movie. There's certain moments that do that and you create those indelible memories and it takes the right person or mix of people to pull that off. And, that's what makes uh, like sometimes it's done to great um, emotional effect the way that this is. Sometimes it's just that like, I can't hear, I love uh, Miserloo by Dick Dale. I've loved that song mm -hmm. since uh, I was a small child. I remember hearing it and just falling in love with like, this just sounds cool. I've never heard anything like it before, but I can't hear that without thinking of the opening of Pulp Fiction now because it's yeah. so tied into it for it. Tarantino knew it's like uh, the opening for, Reservoir Dogs as well with Little Green Bag. Yeah, I can't yep. separate those two. Um, a lot of the musical cues that Edgar Wright uh, comes up with, that guy just is brilliant at putting music into his movies. It's one of the reasons why Baby Driver <clears throat> is such a fantastic movie is the way that he used music in it. And I feel like now that I've you know I've seen two Wes Anderson films, I feel like okay, this guy gets how to use music in his movies it's dude it's it's insane like um <clears throat> like every one of his movies has a song that sticks out that like resonates with a certain scene like james gunn is doing this really well right now james like, gunn is another one james yeah. gunn is just hitting on all weird levels but like e everything from uh fantastic mr fox and back has this moment in the song that just sticks out like uh royal tenenbaums has uh me and julio down the schoolyard mm -hmm. right with oh, so uh, good. gene hackman just riding bikes with his grandchildren and it's just like that when i hear that song man that's exactly where i go and um you know there's um play with fire by the rolling stones is a pivotal scene in the darjeeling limited and like i hear that stone song and I'm just seeing the train flash by with different scenes going through. He it does, man. He does magical things with his soundtracks and even going out and doing the Sue George record. Like, okay, if you guys collect vinyls, these were both pressed on vinyl. On uh, There's a thing called Record Store Day where they only release a s very small number of records for small pressings. And it's kind of random which stores they get thrown to. But they've been pressing Wes Anderson vinyls every so often and both this soundtrack and the sue george soundtrack both came out and mm. i was stuck at work and so i didn't have the opportunity to go out there and as a record collector and a wes <laughs> anderson film and my favorite movie it was just like well how much could it be on ebay <laughs> <laughs> oh, clo oh, close to them shoes, oh. huh? Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. And now yeah. it's not that bad. They're only about like 150 bucks, but it's still more than I want to spend on a record. Yeah. So if you have that just sitting around, anyone, you can you can email me or hit me up on Twitter at Imaginary Nomad, <laughs> and we can talk. That would be uh, yep, Imaginary Nomad at Twitter. Um, no, I I love stuff like that, and I. I you know, I, I have certain composers that I really like, and I usually, I, I for whatever reason, Mark Mothersbaugh isn't the name that pops to mind first, but it should, because when you look through what he's done, it's like he's composed some amazing scores. And everybody likes to talk about, like, Danny Elfman is the, the one, that, that sort of crossover from pop music to writing musical scores, which, absolutely, Danny Elfman's done some amazing work. Mothersbaugh's done just as much uh, that, that I could consider as good um, and just killed it here. And then the, the selection of songs that played, you've mentioned a few of them and they were great. And it just, it adds, 
an extra layer. The movie is still going to be good if the music isn't as good as it is, but that music fitting so well in all those scenes takes it to a different level. And it's like, it's mm-hmm. all the different parts and pieces of this, the, the performances, the look of everything, the set decoration, the way the, the ship is laid out, using that whatever, what, what was it, like 100 and something foot wide by 40 foot tall set that they built that was the, the ship cut in half, and then using that multiple times for these long shots that just, I mean, they're just amazing all the way through. There's the shot where... um Oh, it's after it's after Steve catches uh, Ned. Um, oh yeah, with uh, with uh, with uh, Jane. Yep. And they're like headed up to the top deck, and they're going through the thing, and she like just comes up another set of stairs, and he chases Wolodarsky at one point. Or mm-hmm. Are you guys with the... fighting? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then and he chases you know Vikram, and he's like, "Give me that camera! I'm, I'm gonna you know smash oh, that camera." It cut <laughs> he's never not on like ned almost drowns and they're giving him cpr and like as he just starts to come to and he's like you shooting this wide open i had yeah. that so that was that was oh one of the notes is like the uh, vikram coming in with the light meter multiple oh times that's another joke surreal, that, right oh. it's so quick and now like we... if you know you know and it's mm-hmm. just so funny we live that like Everything is content life. <laughs> yeah. So you're like, yeah, you got to be ready. At a moment's it's notice. All content, and he's, baby. Like, Steve is such a, he's a character who is both blissfully unaware of everything around him except himself, and yet at the same time has moments of introspection. Like, when yeah. he sits down and he talks, he's like, I, you know, the article hurt my feelings because, you know, I mean, people are going to say mean things about me or, you know, think I'm kind of a prick, and then I realized that's just who I am. But he doesn't stop doing that either. Or when, when, uh, when they're at the club. Yeah. Yes. And he overhears the guys uh, talking about him. <laughs> he gets all mad and throws his earring. Yeah, and like, <laughs> and he just immediately puts his hand out. He knows <laughs> Ned's gonna go get it. Yep. It's... And just oh, geez, to just have Owen Wilson like blurring out a shot, then then moves into shot was just oh, I love that angle so much There's so much that and, and that character just so so amazing that he can be that way and then never change any of it either and like you said he's always on he's constantly talking about you know what why did you cut what no you don't cut unless I say so and like here's you know Klaus trying to talk to him about like whatever's going on he's like no 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 you just you do what I say or uh, the I love the oh we'll send him a red cap and a speedo, like mm-hmm. that's just his answer for everything. Is anybody that does anything good, you send him a red cap and a speedo. I'm I'm gonna start using that. I think that's a brilliant. It's, real good. <laughs> it's just oh Bill Bill Murray is so on throughout this whole movie, and Steve Zissou yeah. is such an amazing character, and he's sad too. Like he's a really sad character because he's sort of he's reached that point in his life, especially after losing his best friend. And now he's questioning everything that's going on, but he kind of has to keep that front up of like, no, I'm still Steve Zissou, but what does that really mean? And he's he keeps and questioning it's not just, everything. It's not just losing his best friend; it's losing his best friend, and then having people go, "Did did he kill Esteban for the movie?" <laughs> right, because there's part of you that could believe that would happen. Oh yeah, like that's not out of so, the realm of possibility at all. One of my favorite shots in the movie is after the helicopter crash. And we're in the water and the water, like the camera keeps dipping below and Mm -hmm. Ned's going to be fine. Everything's fine with Ned. No problem. And then like a single like red droplet runs down this runs down the camera and it, oh, it's so good. And then it like dips under. Oh, it's so good. So I was not prepared for that that whole moment in the movie of Ned dying. I'm going to tell and, you now and... because you have not seen that many of them. Most Wes Anderson movies, there's like a good chunk of them, have this moment 
where you do not see it coming and you are blindsided by something pretty terrible happening. I think uh, Darjeeling Limited is probably the worst for me. Um, Second. Second. Yeah. Yep. I agree. You know? <laughs> We're going to fight about who gets to do it's this so movie. Or we can just all come back for, for Darjeeling because... <laughs> Darjeeling broke so, me. I feel like a, I feel like a lot of people, like even people who are like, yeah, I like Wes Anderson movies, they do not give that movie enough credit. No, they don't. Let's make an it's... agreement, and we will all come back and talk about this movie. A hundred percent, I'm in. It's it, so it is written, so shall it be done. Um, but also the fact, I mean, this movie or this character of Steve Zizou is loosely based off of Cousteau, mm -hmm. which. He also lost his son in a, a plane accident. Um, Cousteau's son, Felipe, yeah. uh, died unexpectedly from, from crashing his plane. And it completely changed who Cousteau was. And so <clears throat> I think also when Ned was lost, Steve kind of had almost like a Cousteauian uh, revelation in his own point of view on how he sees the world because this burgeoning relationship that could have been um, is no longer there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and also, when, when you lose Esteban, right, um, everybody hated that movie. So it's like not only did you lose your best friend and partner that you've been with uh, creatively for, I don't know, let's say roughly 20 to 30 years, but A, nobody believes you. And then see everybody hates your movie, right? Bravo! What fun! I just don't think they got it. That it's just like that underrated that scene, line, right? Like when when there's the Q and A, right? And he's like, "Well, I'm gonna hunt it down and I'm going to kill it. I don't know how. Maybe with dynamite." He's like, "Well, it's a, it's an endangered species at at <laughs> best. Like, what scientific purpose would there be to killing it?" revenge revenge yep oh <laughs> but it's funny that lady in the hallway delivering so that line good. about like oh man i good job nobody understood it i just don't think it worked literally could sum up my career in podcasting <laughs> just like, <laughs> bravo. hey man i know bravo you you did you definitely put those hours in didn't you <laughs> Yeah, it was it was rough. Yeah, nobody liked it, but I'm glad that you keep doing it. <laughs> the the best is uh the you know no seriously and he's like, Well, I could have done without it, you know, needing to use the word seriously, seriously, but I'll take it. <laughs> okay, I, I cannot I cannot let us continue without talking about Amory for a minute. Okay, yes. Because I love Amory. Amory under underrated character. Um Amory twenty five script girl, topless. 100% of the time until a moment. And this is like my my deep, ridiculous feminist reading of it. So, because so, even in the party scene, you can see her in the background, but when, when Ned and Steve are talking, and she's wearing a shirt, but it is completely sheer. Yes. Like, she is not. So, she's basically topless until Eleanor leaves. And she then has to become the voice of reason to this group of idiot boys. <laughs> and then she gets to put on a shirt because now she has to be the grown up and not go through unprotected waters. It's only an inch and a half. I, it, there's just no problem. We just go in this way. That's, <sighs> you know, I didn't think about that, but you're right. That is when after, after mm -hmm. Eleanor leaves is when the next scenes we see with her, she's wearing a shirt. And oh. uh, you know, standing up to to Steve and telling him like you can't do this. I didn't think about it that way, but that's a good reading into that because my my only the line was thing... like you know, Anne Marie just topless all the time. Yeah, which I thought was Except a funny, which I thought but was a funny is... running gag. No, but then... she's the yeah. most intelligent person on the boat <laughs> yeah, that she's... never gets a say in anything. Yeah, and then um, I it's a it's a real good like image of the Zisu brand in that right because it's like the oh you're all down here on the beach and you're matching pajamas except they're not like they're all blue stripey pajamas <laughs> but they're not all the same like we've all got blue sweaters with a z but they're all different sweaters and yes. the z's just been sewn on like we're making our own merch out here that was <laughs> such, and I support that that was such a good 
like subtle thing to have in there mm-hmm. too. Like all the, the hats are a little bit 50 different. Fifty units, yeah. Right. Like I can't. I, yeah, well, I all the hats 50 are different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I loved it, and it's everybody's little own personal styles. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Ned has the, uh, the little take off your pants and jacket stoplight, right? Yep. Klaus has his little puffy ball. Mm-hmm. Um, I think even in the wetsuit, my favorite thing uh, was Sue George's uh, hat. Yeah. It's like uh, <laughs> uh, um, almost like um, a fat Albert character, you know, <laughs> exaggerated hat. Yeah. Which was is like, what is the point of that? I don't get it, but I love it. I want to say it was like a pull over, like the hood, like hood but it wasn't pulled over. That would come down and tuck into the oh, wetsuit. Oh yeah, okay, yes. It was that, but he just had it resting on top of his head because I was like, "What the hell hat is that he's wearing? It's amazing." Mm-hmm. I, I loved that. That's that was oh, everyone like all those little things make me want to watch the movie again just to try and notice more of that because there's so much going yep. on in every one of these scenes and every one of these shots, and I know I missed a ton of it. Um, and I'm definitely going to watch this again because holy crap. I mean, it's just it's so good all the way through. What the hell's wrong with me not watching Wes Anderson movies? Well, <laughs> actually, I picked up something new this time through. Um, when they're watching the old adventures of like either the Arctic or they're showing the VHS of like mm-hmm. our vault contains all this money, <laughs> um, there's little action figures next to the tube television that they're watching it on of the entire crew and i said oh what and i pause it and i'm just like 20 20 years i have been what 19 years i've been watching this damn film and i just am pulling this out now this is incredible i guess that's because i just bought the blu-ray and i've been watching it on a, a, a dvd but like i was still, blown away and now oh. also want those mm-hmm. yeah I'm going to look for those and, and see if I can find them or something. Or maybe maybe I'll see if I can print some. 3D print them? Mm. And then you um, can paint them on stream with your miniature painting stream. There we go. Um, and, like, was... both of us had birthdays, so, like. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, <yeah. clears throat> I also, uh, a couple costuming things that I loved. I loved uh, Jeff Goldblum's glasses, which were apparently Mark Mothersbaugh's uh, frames. And they're those thick, but they were silver. I thought those were great. Yeah. And Gambon's uh, Osiri, his glasses mm-hmm. were awesome. And those were apparently modeled after Ennio Morricone's, you know, tiny little Italian man. And yeah, yeah. Those, like I saw those frames. I'm like, I kind of want a pair of those. Those are cool looking. Like I always, I always look at these quirky glasses and then I realize, no, nope, no, nope, they don't make them for ogre sized heads like mine. So no. I couldn't get them. They don't have those on Zenny. So yeah. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I have to figure out a way to like custom build that that kind of stuff. But um, no, I just uh, oh, series so... assistant Philip. <laughs> All right, for like a hot second, I was like, "Wait, that's not is that is that Adrian? Like, it looks not unlike Adrian Brody. What is it? No, 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 it's Noah Baumbach who just happens to look exactly like Adrian Brody. He really does. You're not wrong. <laughs> Which is just weird. There is, like, if you if you squint, you could definitely. That's what I'm in, saying. I was, I was like, is it? Like out in a club or in a dark room in a, in a bar somewhere, you could see either one of those and be like, eh, it's 50 50 which one you're looking at. Yeah, just coin flip. And I love that those two wrote a couple movies together because, mm-hmm. like, Squid and the Whale, man, that, that Noah Baumbach movie is just. It's so heavy. And I love it <laughs> so much. And it came out right after. Uh, life aquatic but if you haven't seen it it's got jeff daniels and laura lenny that are going through a divorce in new york city and it's so weird and quirky but also hurt like just hurts to watch it and then they wrote uh fantastic mr fox together Uh which Which um, is brilliantly written uh it's easy to miss with the animation but it is so so good um, oh with he, the, that he wrote one, the Barbie um, movie that Greta Gerwig uh-huh. is putting out. was Hell written yeah. by Noah Bob. Wes Anderson actually went out to Roald Dahl's uh, widow's home and spent some time with her. And she told him once the movie was out that um, this was the best adaptation of all of his works. And that 
knowing him, he would have loved the Fantastic Mr. Fox the most because it just has his whimsy and joy spilling out of every character in that movie. Yeah. God. I want to watch mm-hmm. that one now. Also, yeah. Noah, Noah Baumbach apparently wrote the screenplay for Madagascar 3, so I feel like that's like sure. an outlier. Like That doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the stuff we're talking about, but... Let's Not see how much you, money you, that made. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, you, exactly. You do it's, what you need to do. There's a little. Yeah, uh, you know, seven hundred and forty-six point nine million dollars. Yeah. Um, okay, you but take that. It's worth it. No problem. It's worth it. Sure. But it's like, uh, it. The writing in this was so good. The direction is is so great. I did capture some audio clips that. Uh, yes. It's all. It's almost all either Steve Zissou or um, Hennessy. Because they just had the quips <laughs> throughout the movie. So, who do you who do you want first? You want Goldblum or you want Murray? No, just go, just go, just surprise. Right. Yeah, just play them all at once. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, here's a line that I'm going to be using a lot now. Remind me, we'll send him a red cap and a speedo. Like mm-hmm. that's just going to become part of my lexicon. It's just it's just going to happen because it's so good. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Oh. No, congratulations. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. I wish it didn't require the seriously, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> also, they get to the island, uh, and they're they're peering in at this what used to be a hotel, and it's just like, you know, it's the pool that has a little bit of water left in it, and the only thing he can think of is What a shame. They had a bartender here, Kino, made the best rum cannonball I've ever tasted. <laughs> <laughs> If I had had the stuff, my other I'd favorite line from the from tonight. from the island that I use a lot is "swamp leeches." Everybody, check. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the only one that got hit? What's what's the deal? Yeah, I had. And so I'll, I'll use that, hit? right? I'm the only the... one. What's the deal? <laughs> it was so I good. use it, right? And people look at me and they're like, "What the hell are you talking about?" It's like. I'm the only one who got hit. What, what's the deal? And everyone's like, uh, all right, man. Okay. Okay, okay. okay weird person. You just calm down. Um, it, that was, yeah. So Nobody else got hit? I'm the only one? What's the deal? That's such a, a good Bill Murray moment. Um, mm-hmm. Even the, the introduction of Jeff Goldblum, and then you cut to Goldblum talking to Angelica Houston. So here's Hennessy talking to Eleanor, and then, Steve just kind of slides into frame. He's just... Don't be nice to Allie. He's my nemesis. (laughs) He's my nemesis. And there's so many great moments like that between where two characters are talking and it's just a non sequitur into something else like... Oh, Siri, this is uh, probably my son, Ned. We just met. (laughs) (laughs) This is probably my son. We just met. Probably my son. And... Michael Gambon, just the perfect response. That is like, oh, how delightful! Like, I just, oh, I love Michael Gambon so Michael much. Michael Gambon is fantastic. So Ugh. much. Um, Not only that, but like, he meets Ned. He needs to go out and and hit his joint <laughs> yeah. before he can like really just focus <laughs> on what's actually happening right now. <laughs> Um, he caught me with one foot over the edge there. One, yeah, one foot off the merry-go-round. It's so good. That's it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I think Phil, you quoted this one. I want to say it was on Twitter uh, earlier this week mm-hmm. um, or last week, mm-hmm. and and finally, you know, hearing it in the movie, it made your your tweet made so much more sense. I knew it was something from the movie, but I just loved. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go on an overnight drunk, and in ten days, I'm going to set out to find the shark that ate my friend and destroy it. Anyone that would care to join me is more than welcome. And unfortunately, I didn't have enough characters to do the whole thing. And then also I had to make it, you know, fit what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, but I did hold to that tr- that promise. I did go on yeah, an overnight drunk that that's day. That's important. Good. You know what? I'm a man of my word. <laughs> Consistency. It's what I exp- that's what I hope for. You know, I have to put in the work, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. This one's just labeled music. Method podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> It's meth, Ed. <laughs> there we go. I'm not sure what music, why I labeled this one music, but here we go. Supposedly, Cousteau and his cronies invented the idea of putting it walkie-talkies into the helmet. Dancing. But we made ours with a special rabbit ear on the top so we could pipe in some music. I loved that, and he just he starts to do that little hip sway dance, and I was. I... It's so good. In his wetsuit. Mm-hmm. In those shiny, 
and everybody's again to to your point of like how everybody's wearing the same but not the same <clears throat> everybody's wetsuit is a slightly different shade of that like aqua sea green blue you can also see i noticed this time um after he falls down the stairs and he's just laying there with like his <laughs> arms up and it's like close up on him you can see that like all of the seal and on all the seams <laughs> is like all kind of not Eroded. great <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, you know, it's real good. The thing I like about that song, though, is like the first time it hits the movie, it's that very, you know, uh, Casio boom thap with just uh, mm -hmm. the quick notes. But that, like everything else in this movie, evolves mm -hmm. over time. So by yeah. the time that they do hit the beach, there's strings, there's horns, there's chaos, and it just builds throughout it's, the entire film. It's what film. they would do if they had the budget. If they had yes. the budget. <laughs> yeah. Yep, exactly. Uh, Steve uh, complaining about the dolphins. Son of a bitch, I'm sick of these dolphins. I'm sick of these dolphins. <laughs> That's another one that you could just throw out there. And it, uh, mm -hmm. if people have seen the movie, they're going to get that line. And if not, they're just going to look at you know, like you're a crazy oh, person. Like what is wrong with you? I will say, bless my girlfriend who had to sit down and watch this movie with me. She was unaware that I knew every line uh, during <laughs> every scene. So it was very, I could tell within the first like 10 minutes that, all right, you need to cool down, Philip, or she's going <laughs> to leave. Not just the room, but she's going to leave you. <laughs> she's just going to uh, So bless, go. bless her heart for, uh, for dealing with my bullshit. <laughs> Um, so good. When they're when they're giving the, they cut to uh, them giving saying a few words over the pirate, uh, before they're gonna dump mm -hmm. him overboard, <laughs> and then you, you hear the boat and it's just like everybody's pointing and looking over it except for Klaus, and then Steve looks over and he's just holy shit, son of a bitch, cut. <laughs> <laughs> But Klaus gave the same Bible quote to the pirate and to Ned. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh God. I mean, he and already it wrote it. He didn't get to yeah, do the whole right. thing. You know. <laughs> he's gonna finish it. Damn it. You don't <laughs> waste content. Oh, no, you're right. You're they, right. And they go mm -hmm. down into the the oceanographic uh, institute there, uh, the underwater one, and they're getting ready to steal everything. And then it's just. All right, everybody. We got about twenty five to thirty minutes before the Coast Guard gets here to arrest us. That could be Steve Zissou or Bill Venkman could have said that same line. Yeah. Like Pete, oh, Pete, so Venkman. Pete Venkman, yeah. Steve Zissou, the, the, either one. Sure. It um, could just straight up be Bill, Bill Murray on like any yeah, given Tuesday. True. Yeah. Um, oh, this, I mentioned this one earlier. Well, I was a little embarrassed at first. Obviously, people are going to think I'm a showboat and a little bit of a prick. But then I realized that's me. And it's that like that moment of like, no, I, I understand who I am, but it doesn't change him. He he still does that that kind of stuff uh, moving forward, which I thought was great. Um, again, everything's content. How are you shooting this kick from wide open? Uh, light five six. <laughs> like that killed me because it was just the hand reaching in with the light meter and then going away, and then that that gag is done a second time later on. Where they're at the, he's like, yes. "How's everything looking?" He just pushes the light meter out and kind of gives them the nod, and then they go. I love that so um, much. The, well, that and then when they're like all blindfolded and tied up by the pirates, <laughs> and he's like, "Are you getting this?" And he's like, how much you, how, "How's the coverage, Vikram?" <laughs> I got as much but as I could before they put the camera he's got the backwards. Camera. Yeah. yeah, he's holding the camera backwards to make sure he can get as much as he can. Yeah. Now, I mean, Travis, so, like, I will. I, I was oh, I, like, I, I will. The <laughs> Please go, go ahead. So he he's also in the Darjeeling Limited as Is well. Is he okay? Um, as one of the more prominent characters, and like he was good in this movie. Mm -hmm. He's fantastic yeah. in oh. Darjeeling. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, uh, I was going to see the, the part after the Ned scene is actually where you as the audience think that maybe Steve did let Esteban die because <laughs> yeah. he's having the conversation with Eleanor and she's like, did his heart stop before you pulled him out? And he's well, like, yeah, but we got well, him started. Yeah, again. but we got him going again. We got him going again. <laughs> it's fine. Um, let's see this. One, I don't remember what this one was. Nobody else got hit. I'm the oh. only one. What's the deal? Yeah, what's the deal? I, I just played yeah. that one out. And then this this was another one of those, it's it, just a perfect moment. Can you hear the jack whale singing? Yes. It's beautiful. 
He's like, no, that's the tugboat over there. Oh. That's the sludge tanker. <laughs> yeah, the sludge tanker. Oh, God. Uh, there well, he's from Kentucky. You know, yeah, landlocked. There's some pretty country out there. Uh, and we got a we got a couple of uh, of Hennessy uh, moments here. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Let's see. Uh, this is just Jeff Goldblum. I love it. And I mean, it's just <laughs> I love it. It's the way he says that. Uh, if you're uh, what are you calling it? Leopard fish? Jaguar shark? Le- leopard? <laughs> Jaguar <laughs> shark? Oh, that's and um. <laughs> I just became a knight in Portugal. But- just Jeff Goldblum being Jeff Goldblum is one of my favorite mm-hmm. things in movies, period. And it's just the way he delivers mm-hmm. that. I just became a knight in, in Portugal. Portugal. Uh, because he got one of his he got he got one of his new merit badges. That was, yeah. that was such, badges, such a good, good exchange between him and Angelica Houston, too. So good. I mean, I know we said it, but gosh darn man, I love her so much. Oh, She's so good. <clears throat> like, and, I, I she was wonderful for for me personally, like uh, when I saw her a couple of years ago in Transparent, the show mm-hmm. on, um, oh, I was blown away. Yeah, blown away because like I've I've literally have since I was born have fell in love with her movies, and each movie she gets just a little bit better and a little bit better. And so to watch her on Transparent, it was like just full evolution of just there's nothing you can do, yeah. and I'm here for all of it. <laughs> yes, uh, and final. Uh, Jeff Goldblum, uh, and this was, I love this because it's set up by him telling Steve, neither one of us were ever very good husbands. Yes. Yes, this is my excuse as well. I have a good excuse. I'm part gay. (laughs) Supposedly everyone. Which I have used multiple times in my life. (laughs) He says that to him, and I got to play it one more time because it's just. Of course, I have a good excuse. I'm part gay. Supposedly everyone is. And then they just have they just have the little hug and then he just walks away. He just his head's <laughs> off down there. And it's just it's so uh, good. Well, and it's so good because Steve the whole movie has been like, Well, I always thought he was a closet case. Yeah. He's <laughs> like making the all whole, these lines. He's got about all of his like, like his all all of his like, you know, Hennessy youth boys <laughs> on his <laughs> boat. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to gonna have to crew up from scratch next time she's louise jojo <laughs> hennessy <Yes. laughs> the hennessy youth oh my god so yeah uh those those were my audio clips i had one other really cool uh really interesting little um uh trivia bit that i i just it laughed and when i was watching through a second time i noticed it was um the one intern who is uh-huh. played by an actor who's actually Wes Anderson's like assistant. He, uh, <laughs> when they're when they're doing their workout in the background, he he sprains his ankle, and you watch him like you watch his foot come down, and I watch it twist, and he goes down, and that's the shot they use in the movie. And I like the reasoning behind it because he wore matching socks that day, which is apparently bad luck for him. Like every other day, he would wear mismatched <laughs> socks, and the one day he wore matching socks, they did that shot, and he twisted his ankle, and that just Perfect. cracked me up. Uh, but yeah, they... this movie was his first movie, and it like it kind of jump started this this kid's career. Yeah. I remember, I know this is really weird, but uh, I remember seeing him after that in this very strange Robin Williams family movie called RV. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, and and then I saw him again uh, in one of my favorite heartbreak movies that I put on when I want to feel sad and and just dive into it is Five Hundred Days of Summer. He's in that as well, and. Yeah. Uh, I always enjoy him whenever I see him come around. Yeah, and I think like this got started. He was just he was Wes Anderson's like production assistant basically, and this started his career in acting. He's done. He was Simon in the Alvin and the Chipmunks movies. For like, oh, there's reasons. your paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Five Hundred Days of Summer. Um, there's something else I've seen him in. Oh, he did a voice of Riddler in Batman Assault on Arkham. That could be interesting. Oh. Ah, interesting. Huh. But it's just funny how some some careers start like that, where you just you just happen to be like an extra kind of joke character, and you can build a career out of it. So, yep. good on him. 
But I just thought that was hilarious that uh, the the story behind it is that he wore matching socks for the one time because I guess his grandmother had told him that mis uh, mismatched socks was good luck. Sure. So that he always did that. I don't mess with what grandma says. No, no, you never mess with grandma wisdom. Nope. I um, um was he was he on the outro run? I, I don't remember if if the intern number one was was on the I outro. Think so. uh, Nico, I'm sorry. Yeah. Ned corrected yes. us. His name is Nico. Nico. If if Nico was on the um the Buckaroo Bonsai <laughs> stolen outro run, yes. that was I'm oh. pretty sure he is. I want to say so because he, I mean, as the one intern who stayed around, which is the one intern left. Yeah, that was the great slaps him on the shoulder. (laughs) Oh God! (laughs) God, Steve. But he's he's going to give him an A though. He's getting an A for at at the University of North Alaska. I'm not going to fail you, but (laughs) I'm going to give you an incomplete. (laughs) I'm going to give you an incomplete (laughs) for the mutiny. (laughs) Oh, the, the. I can't believe I slept on this movie for almost twenty years too. I have no, I have no valid reason for it. This is right up my alley in terms of the kinds of like, because I like a lot of different movies. I don't fall into any specific categories, but stuff like this is great because it is not your normal movie fare. It's not, um, you know, kind of your Hollywood action movies or your Hollywood dramas or standard sort of comedies it's a little bit different than all of that because Wes Anderson's a little bit different than everybody and uh-huh. uh, now that I've seen two of his movies I'm uh, I'm going to say that uh, he makes movies that I like and so I need to watch well, the rest here, of them now here's here's the great thing and I would love to take a line out of this movie that uh, this is an adventure and you're you're right right uh, on on the uh, Joseph Campbell wheel, you're you're right at stage two, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the call to action has happened, um, and it's great because even though this is my favorite movie of all time, it's most certainly not Wes Anderson's best movie. And no, I, I'm excited. It's up there, I, Trav. Man, I'm really excited uh, to come back every so often as uh, you, me, and Amy cover Wes Anderson, so I can watch <laughs> you. You know, it's like watching, uh, introducing uh, my favorite band to, you know, my kid, right? Uh (laughs) Like I get to experience this, this something that I love through the eyes of, of, of a new perspective. And it's going to be fun, man. I'm excited. Like, I I know I'm hijacking your show and just telling you that we're doing this now, but that we're doing this now. I'm sorry. Like you you open the door, you open the door and like, I'm missile kicking my way through it. I can't wait. (laughs) Well, and you know, you know how it is. Anytime you're so attached to something and you show it to somebody else or you let somebody else experience that, there is that little bit of trepidation where you're like, are they going to like it or not? Did either of you worry that I wouldn't oh, like this? No, I know you better than no, that. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, right, I've been fair. there, right? I've been trying to push like neutral milk onto people and they're mm. like, what the hell is this dribble? It's just like, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> you mispronounced masterpiece. Uh, but no, dude. I, I knew for a fact that, like, this was your M.O., yeah. and that you were going to love. Because, dude, with you and movies, it's all about the writing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you, you always look for good writing, and you always love long, panned-out shots. Guess what, buddy? <laughs> we got a lot of them in our future. I'm a sucker for both of those and I knew things. That, and I knew that, like, you love a good soundtrack that makes sense and has cohesion and, like, is used properly to bring out emotion and just, it's going to be fun. I'm excited. No, well, good. I, I am excited, too. And Kurt is in our chat, and he was saying he felt the same way about 12 Angry Men. And watching that for the previous episode, I was blown away by how good that was. Like, that's another It was a one. really good episode, you two. I, I had a lot of fun with that because that movie, there was a lot to chew on in that movie. And I, like, I'm like i still processing and thinking about uh, a lot of the stuff in that in terms of like how I can use what was in that movie to help debate in my life in general. Because it's such uh, there's so much you can learn from that. And I think from a storytelling standpoint and character standpoint, stuff like this works for that really well too. I really loved the way you had characters that... Because characters don't have to go through a huge change to change and evolve. Steve isn't yeah. that different from the at the end of the movie than he is from the beginning, but there's enough that has changed and enough that he has gone through that there is some character growth there. 
and I like that. And you're right. I'm a sucker for good writing, and I'm a sucker for these like composed shots and long takes. And there's something about that that hybrid of film and like stage play that I'm watching being filmed that is really interesting to me that you just don't see. And you certainly don't see done as well as it was in this movie. And if this isn't his best, then I'm excited to watch some more. <laughs> so, ah, mm-hmm. uh, dude. So they bought that boat from South Africa and they had to sail it up to the Mediterranean and it oh, got there crap. just in time. Um, for Darjeeling Limited, they just said, the hell with it. We're buying a train. And then they <laughs> turn it into kind of like the Belafonte, but. Yeah. You know how the Belafonte is like a character? Mm-hmm. This train it's, itself in Darjeeling also takes on the personification of a character. And it's just, oh. it's got my boy Jason, which this movie is missing. And uh, oh, Schwartz, it's good. Is that Schwartzman? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. dude. All right. Because I liked him in Rushmore a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, so mm-hmm. mm, I'm, looking forward, I'm looking forward to all of these movies. Um, and thank, thank you, both of you, for badgering me and beating me down to finally get me to watch this movie because uh, I owe you for that. <laughs> Big time. It's all right. Yeah. We'll send you a red cap and a Speedos in the mail. And, uh... <laughs> Perfect. Um, now, next week, I'm going in a slightly different direction. Uh, we're going to go back to 1991 and uh, a fun little action movie called The Rocketeer. I'm going to watch. Uh <gasps> Katra, who used to be known as Ace, is coming back. We're going to talk because they've never seen it. And I love The Rocketeer. That's just yeah. like as a fun. This is this is how you make a family fun action movie based off of uh, a, yeah. pro- a product that, uh, you know, nobody's ever heard of before um, the, in The Rocketeer. Because I remember when this came out. Uh, so I'm super looking forward to that. And then after after The Rocketeer, we are getting into August. Everyone knows what August means yes. for this show. Cage of Cage Palooza. Palooza. Yes. Heck yeah. So lots of fun Nick Cage stuff going on, uh, including I will finally, finally get to watch Renfield. Uh, I have been I've been avoiding everything to do with that since, uh, you know, JF, who's going to come on and talk. Because he, when, when, when that movie came out, he immediately sent me a message and said, I'm, I'm pretty claiming... sure it was when the trailer came out. He was like, I'm claiming, I'm claiming Renfield for this year's Cage of Palooza. I was like, fine. And then he went and watched it. So, I, so I've had to wait. Um, but I'm also getting somebody to watch Face Off. And I can't wait for that. But that's going to be fun because nice. that movie is bonkers as hell. Um, and some more. Like, I just so... watched that recently. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you did. For the you first did. time. Yeah, for the first time. It was, <laughs> it was something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Uh, so that's, that's coming up. Um, but... Thank you both so much for being here this week. I'm going to start with Amy. Amy, let people know about uh, stuff you're working on and where they can find it. We just wrapped up season six of Equilo. Um, So you've now got a lot of hours. It's like over 55 hours, I think, now of um, quality audio storytelling. Um, It's a lot. um, And you can find that at Equilo.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, I have a bunch of things in the works. I just moved and I'm settling into my new space. But once that happens, a lot more stuff is going to happen. Uh, so you can follow me on all the social medias. All of them? Probably. I'm active more on some than others. But Twitter, Instagram, uh, Newly Blue Sky, uh, Threads, Coffee, if you want to follow me there, because I guess that's a thing I could post on. <laughs> um, I am literally everywhere as Daniora, D A N I O R A. Excellent. I just finished uh, listening to season six of Ake Willow and I loved it. So, excellent. Definitely. That's one of the those story podcasts that I tell everybody about because it's just that good. You and JF kill it with that. And Phil, you. what about you? You're, you work on a bunch of different stuff. Uh, I am the imaginary nomad on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram with a one. You can normally find me on Twitch Sunday nights playing uh, horror games because I hate them, but the community loves them. <clears throat> We're currently playing through Outlast Trials, which is, uh, it's dreadful. It <laughs> literally is dreadful. I don't like doing it. I have, You guys pay for the games for me to play, and I hate doing it, but here we go. It's this, like, there's a, a viscera of pure terror that, I can't produce 
unless I'm in this game. Like I, I love <laughs> scary movies. I read horror novels, but once these these game like once I get into LS Trials, it's it's really really rough. Um, <clears throat> so if that seems like your jam, find me on Twitch. Also, I'm a retro streamer uh, through the week, Mondays and Tuesdays. We're playing uh, Pokemon Red. Uh, we are tripping through the Pokedex as we go through all the different Pokemon games. I'm on Botched, a D&D podcast. It is an improv comedy show loosely draped in the rotting skin of 5e D&D. We're finishing up season seven, which uh, was our cowboy season. And season eight will premiere down at Dragon Con in the Hilton main ballroom this year. Uh, we got oh, the wow. big room. So Ooh. come check us out at Dragon Con, uh, we'll be doing SCP. If you don't know what that is, Google it like I did and dive into it. <laughs> uh, if you're not watching Those Were the Days, then you can come over to twitch.tv slash botch podcast on Monday nights as we do botched films. Tomorrow, if you're here live, we are watching the 2022 American Christmas action comedy film, Violent Night. So if that is up your jam, you can come watch it with us and have fun if you like uh mr no we lost him oh we lost him and he's coming oh no and maybe hey, he's back he's back i i can see you that was weird you lost me yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my god i didn't lose you guys at all <laughs> Uh, if you like Mystery Science Theater, but want it done shittily by people in Pennsylvania, uh, check out Botch Films every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Excellent. Uh, I have no definitely... puppets, just people wearing masks saying that they're okay when they're actually not. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you both so much for being here. This was great. It's, it's always fun to get to do a show like this with some of my favorite people. And then to get shown a brand new movie that I haven't seen and get that get get that turned back on me is 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 so much more fun um so thank you thank you so much and uh we'll definitely um we'll definitely be going through the rest of wes anderson's catalog and uh and the two of you have that um it, it's 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 <laughs> one or both of you for each of those movies it's a, it's all right man we i would love to co-parent if you're okay with that. <laughs> Sounds great. We can work out a schedule, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. you know what? Um, I'll be the stricter parent. Because, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I've got rules. But... And and this show uh, is live every Sunday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time, right here, twitch.tv slash TV's Travis. You can hang out in the chat. Be like uh, Kurt, uh, Katra, JF is in there. Um, and uh, it's always fun to have people in the live chat. show comes out on Wednesdays, anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, you can go. You can follow me on all the socials as TV's Travis. Uh, I'm not on Blue Sky yet, though. I'm not. I'm not cool enough for that. Um, but everything else, I'm TV's Travis uh, or TV's Travis .com. You can find links to everything there, links to my Discord uh, and uh, things like merch. And there's a Patreon for this show, Patreon.com forward slash WYHS or uh, a link through TV's Travis .com. And patrons get uh, special access to things on the Discord channel, the monthly um, movie catch-up nights, and my upcoming video series will debut on Patreon first, and though there will probably be longer versions that are less cut up for uh, content uh, ID stuff on, um, on YouTube. So definitely check all that out. Uh, and come on back next week for The Rocketeer. I can't wait for that. That's just going to be super fun. So for Phil and for Amy... Thank you so much for being here. Uh, get out, enjoy your movies, stay home, enjoy them. That's fine either way, uh, but be excellent to each other. Espresso machine? What, what is, how, how did you get my espresso machine? Well, uh, we fucking stole it, man. Uh, <laughs> that <laughs> made me laugh so hard. Uh.